Welcome to the Cyber Center for Biblical Studies. Hi, my name is Herb Bateman. This is the third of a four-part video series of a conference held in 2014, Let's Know the Bible. The speaker of this video is myself. The focus of the video is God's current story. Once again, I'll be referencing a booklet throughout the video available on Amazon. In the meantime, enjoy and thank you for watching. We want to focus our attention on uh, two books in the New Testament, uh, focusing on God's current story. And we're going to look at two books, the book of Matthew and the book of Romans. And so let's go ahead and begin with the book of Matthew. And when we think about uh, Matthew's gospel, and we were to ask ourselves, who or what is the subject of Matthew's gospel, we'd have to say that it's, uh, the subject of Matthew's gospel is the presentation and the rejection of Jesus as God's Messiah and the coming of God's kingdom. So the subject of Matthew is the presentation of Jesus as Messiah and the coming of God's kingdom as well as the rejection of Messiah and God's kingdom. Okay, that's the subject. That's the focal point of the book of Matthew. So when you sit down and read the, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, you've got to keep that in mind. That's what Matthew's about. It's not what Mark's about. It's not what Luke's about. It's what Matthew is about. So then we look at the occasion for writing the Gospel of Matthew. Well, the occasion in determining that is a little more difficult because we really don't know. We don't know much about the specifics, but we can surmise from Matthew's content that Matthew is addressing Christians, Jewish Christians, who are being persecuted by non-Jewish Christians. So the content of Matthew seems to lead us to believe and, and draw this conclusion. This is a gospel written to Jewish believers who are currently being persecuted by non-Jewish uh, uh, believing Jews, non-believing Jews. Now, let's talk about some of these content. Uh, possibilities. First, when we think about the content, Jesus' teaching is clearly in conflict with the religious leaders of his day. So as you look at Matthew and you see uh, the, uh, uh, Jesus' teaching, it is in contrast to the li religious leaders concerning this. You ready? Righteousness. The religious have, leaders have one form of righteousness and what constitutes righteousness, and Jesus is challenging that. Now, let me give you an example. And these, once again, are in your notes. And we read about it in Matthew chapter 5. Or have you not read in the law that the priests in the temple desecrate the Sabbath, and yet you are not guilty? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. If you had known what this means, I want mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. So they had this preconceived idea of what was important. Sacrificing. That's important. And God said, I really don't give a rip about sacrifice. You know what I care about? How are you treating one another? That's more important than sacrifice in the temple. And he had another example in 23. Woe to you blind guides who say, Whoever swears by the temple is bound by nothing, but whoever swears by the God of the temple is bound by the oath. Blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? And whoever swears by the altar is bound by nothing, but if anyone swears by the gift on it, he is bound by that oath. You are blind, for which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift. So whoever swears by the altar, swears by it and everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple, swears by it and the one who dwells in it. And whoever swears by heaven, swears by the throne of God and the one who sits on it. Ah, there's a lot of stuff there, right? And like, what in the world is he talking about? Well, you know what? You know what he's saying? Stop swearing 
to this, that, and the other thing. And we're not talking about four-letter words, wordy dirts, you know, that culturally we kind of think are... That's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about wordy dirts. He's talking about... James sums it up this way in chapter 5. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Be a person of integrity. That's what he's concerned about. Be honest. What's the occasion for Matthew's gospel? Another thing, I think. So we see the conflict with what constitutes righteousness. Jesus challenges religious leaders and what they consider to be righteous, and Jesus challenges that. Then you have a conflict in here. It concerns the promise of Messiah, and his authority was questioned and in conflict with the expectations of many Judean Jews. Jesus, as God's promised Messiah, and his authority was questioned and in conflict. And we talked a little bit about this because the Jews were expecting one type of Messiah and Jesus has come as a different one. So we see in Matthew 1, 1 to 3, we see it, this is the record of the genealogy of Jesus who is the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And what's really interesting, as you read through these opening chapters in Matthew, you see the genealogy beginning with Abraham and there's a group of people that fit that Abrahamic covenant section. Then he moves into David, and there's a group of people that are in that Davidic covenant section in that period of time. Then you look at the latter part of this genealogy, and you see the new covenant and uh, people from that grouping. And so everything is pointing in Matthew to what? The fulfillment of God's promise, the Abrahamic, Davidic, and new covenant within that genealogy. Now, the birth of Jesus, and what we want to see is how Jesus is in conflict with uh, leaders in Jerusalem who is the Christ, it happened this way. While the mother Mary was engaged to Joseph, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the time of King Herod, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is the one who's born king of the Jews? And when Herod heard this, he jumped up and down for joy. Yeah, show me that king! And that did not happen. He was alarmed and all Jerusalem with him. They weren't happy campers. Then we move into Matthew 21, and uh, this is later on in the gospel, and we read that they brought the donkey and the colt and placed the cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road. Others cut branches from the trees, and they spread them on the road, and crowds went ahead of them saying, and those following kept shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. But when the chief priests and the experts of the law uh, saw the wonderful things he did and heard the children singing out in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they became... Indignant. Conflict with Messiah. And then, of course, uh, the ultimate conflict was, uh, occurs, and we're going to look at Matthew 26 here. While they were eating, Jesus took the blood. Oh, we got a repeat. We saw this earlier in Luke in the last session. And after giving thanks, he broke it, gave, uh, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And after taking the cup and giving thanks, he, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the covenant that is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you from now on, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And after the singing of the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and we all know what follows. He's arrested, tried, convicted, and put to death, but resurrected. What's the occasion for Matthew? Well, I think we could uh, point to one other uh, thing, and that is uh, Matthew presents the repeated offer of the kingdom to Judeans, the recurring rejection of God's kingdom as, and the subsequent proclamation of kingdom to all nations. So we have a repeated offer of the kingdom and the rejection is, and, the, and the subject, subject the, uh, the subject, sub, subsequent 
proclamation of the kingdom to all nations. Now, I don't, I'm not going to put a slide in here. Once again, this is in your notes, but there are places in here where Jesus presents the kingdom. It's already in your presence. But yet there's that anticipation of a future aspect of the kingdom yet to come. And that you can look at later on when you go and you say, I'm going to read the book of Matthew with some intelligence. I got a great set of notes to guide me. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Thank you. That was a little weak, but that's all right. <laughs> so what's the occasion for Matthew's gospel? Well, I, let me just say the gospel reveals, Matthew's gospel reveals that the Jewish leaders and the people of Judea were in constant conflict with Jesus as Messiah and his proclamation of the kingdom of God. So perhaps... Jewish believers were still facing conflict from other Jews, and Matthew wrote his gospel to reaffirm Jewish believers that though they're teaching about Jesus as Messiah and the presence of the kingdom was in conflict with the Jewish leaders, Jewish teachers of the law, he wants them to stand firm. Hang in there. What's Matthew's message? What's his intention? Well, I would frame it this way. Matthew's intention for recounting the life, the example, and the kingdom teachings of Jesus, who is our Messiah, is so that his disciples, we, the church, might be reaffirmed about Jesus' Messiahship and thereby live as kingdom saints, proclaim the kingdom message, and make disciples of the kingdom. That's how I look at the, the gospel of Matthew. The church is reaffirmed about Jesus. The church is to live as kingdom saints. The church is to proclaim the kingdom message. And the church is to make disciples for the kingdom. Now, which brings me to the key verse for the gospel of Matthew. The key verse, I think, is in 28 verses 19 to 20. And we read, Therefore, go, in to, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember this, I am with you always till the end of the age. Now, I, I want to emphasize the fact that in this key verse, which is occurring at the end of Matthew, what's the emphasis? Teaching what I taught, right? Teaching what I taught you. Well, what have you taught me, Jesus? <laughs> well, to find that out, we need to understand the literary flow for the Gospel of Matthew. And when we look at the literary flow of Matthew, it begins with a prologue. It tells us something about the Davidic line of Messiah. We talked about that a little bit, about the genealogy, his birth and his preservation, okay? But once we get through that little narrative section, we have this section, uh, another narrative section, which introduces Jesus' Messiahship. And right after that introduction of his Messiahship, we have kingdom teaching. Kingdom teaching. It's kingdom teaching about the kingdom's ethic. That's where we read about the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the merciful. And there's a lot of teaching about the ethic of kingdom living. Then we move into a transition. And once it's done, there's a transition. And it came about when Jesus had finished these words. There's, a, there's, a, there's an emphasis to the fact that there's a teaching. Now we're going to move back to the narrative. By the way, moving back to our story now display of Jesus' messiahship and power and authority. And then, the important stuff. Kingdom teaching about the mission of the kingdom and the potential for suffering. And then, transition. After that transition statement, we're back to the narrative. Meanwhile, back to our story. Every, examples of opposition of, to Jesus' messiahship. And so we got this narrative explaining this opposition. And then, kingdom teaching. Now we're talking about growth of the kingdom. And there's a lot of parables here, like the mustard seed, and Jesus is focusing on the growth of the kingdom. 
and now it's going to grow. And after that teaching, there's a transitional statement. And immediately after that transitional statement, now, back to our story. And we have growing opposition to Jesus' messiahship and subsequent withdrawals. And after that, that storyline, and after he's done explaining that in the narrative section, teaching, kingdom teaching. Kingdom teaching about life in the kingdom. Great chapter. Extremely convicting chapter because it begins about having and being like a child. Humble. I, mean, I think a child who, who, you know, when they do something wrong, they, oh, I'm sorry, Mommy, Daddy, will you forgive me? And, of course, Mom, Dad says, yes. And the chapter ends with people uh, with a story about a servant unwilling to forgive another servant. Eh? He repents and refuses to forgive, and that's not kingdom life. How do we relate with one another? Be humble like a child. Do something wrong to a brother and sister, and you say, I'm sorry. And our response is, I forgive you. That's kingdom living. Repentance, forgiveness. And then we go back to a formal presentation of Jesus as Messiah and his rejection of Jerusalem. And then he gets into some teaching about the future of the kingdom. Transition line. After the teaching of the future of the kingdom, we move to the conclusion, which is Messiah, Jesus, is crucified, resurrected, and given authority. So that's the structure of Matthew. And you've got to recognize narrative, kingdom teaching, narrative, kingdom teaching, narrative, kingdom teaching. It's teaching about the kingdom. What does Matthew contribute to God's big picture? Well, Matthew's narrative material presents Jesus as Messiah, the king of Israel, the one through whom God fulfilled his promises. Now, I make mention of this in your notes, and I have a chart in here where I identify um, uh, biblical texts that um, in Matthew that are seen as uh, fulfillment, where, Jesus, where Matthew will cite a biblical text that says, and this was done to fulfill this, and this was done to fulfill this. And so you got a lot of this fulfillment stuff going on in Matthew. And I want to pull out one example of how Matthew is using the Old Testament. We want to look at uh, uh, Hosea 11.1, 1, because Matthew says that what happens to Jesus uh, fulfills Hosea 11.1. 1. So let's look at Hosea 11.1. 1. When Israel was a young man, I loved him like a son, and I summoned my son out of Egypt. And then Matthew, we read, Then he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and went to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod died. In this way, what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet was fulfilled. I called my son out of Egypt. Okay. Now, typically what we might think is, what, ha- what is said in Hosea is directly related to Jesus. <laughs> because when you read Hosea in its context, it says when Israel was a young man, when it was a young nation. In Matthew, who's the referent? Jesus. And so you need to ask yourself, okay, what's going on here? This isn't a direct prophecy about Jesus. In Hosea, it's about Israel. And then in Matthew, it's about Jesus. So what's the connection, Matthew? What's going on? How how is Jesus fulfilling Hosea? Well, let, let let me put it to you this way. In Hosea 1, God has preserved Israel, the nation, oftentimes referred to in the Old Testament as firstborn son. In other words, a special Israel as a nation has a special relationship with Yahweh. Among all the nations, he's firstborn. Unique relationship with Yahweh. And Israel was uh, was preserved from the wrath of Pharaoh. Now in Matthew, God had preserved Jesus. Firstborn son 
He's a Jewish idea of a king having a unique relationship. Of all the Jews in Israel, the king has a unique relationship, firstborn son of all the chosen of Israel. And he was spared from the wrath of Herod. So it's not a direct prophecy. So when we see these fulfillment things, sometimes there is a pattern that is similar in the Old Testament with what's happening in the New Testament. There are times when there is a, a direct prophecy being made about Jesus, but many times there's a pattern that happened in the Old Testament that is being applied to Jesus in the New Testament and what's happening in his life. So when we see these fulfillment statements, we ought not to jump to the conclusion that this equals that as direct prophecy. The same is themes. Sometimes there are themes in the Old Testament that get carried over into the New and, and expressed and, and expanded in the New Testament. Sort of like, long live the king, is when they said that of Solomon. Was that eternal, or was that as long as he lives? But in the New Testament, when we say Jesus is eternal king, we're talking what? Eternal. There's an expansion of a concept. He's the ultimate Davidic king who will never die, who will never end. And his rule will never end. It is permanent. So we got a theme being expanded on. Finally, so I mean it's important to pick that up and recognize that. Um, and then I have a list of quotations there. Uh, I want to talk about the, the uh, contribution that uh, uh, Matthew makes to the picture. And I think I just want to simply say it this way. Matthew's narrative material presents the teachings of Jesus, of the kingdom, that are being shared with others, shared with others, lived out by those who claim to be followers of Jesus, the church, despite the conflict and any rejection suffered. I think that's the, the focus as we think about how this contributes to God's picture. The teachings of the kingdom that are to be shared with others and lived out by all who claim to be followers of the king, despite the conflict we might face. Now we move to Romans. Romans. What is the subject of Romans? Well, it's righteousness. It's God's righteousness. The subject of Paul's letter to the Romans is simply God's righteousness. What's the occasion? Well, the occasion for writing Romans is varied. Uh, on the one hand, uh, it talks about uh, his desire to visit with them. Paul writes to prepare the believers in Rome for his visit, to strengthen their faith, and to address a tension that is existing between Jew and Gentile, the Jew and Gentile believers. So it's to introduce the, his desire to visit, to strengthen them in their faith in following Jesus and to deal with some tensions between Jew and Gentiles. We read in Romans 1, 8 to 13, I thank my God through Jesus, who is the Christ, for all of you, all of you, both Jew and Gentile, because for this simple reason, your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit by preaching in the gospel of the Son, is my witness that I continually remember you and always ask in my prayers, if perhaps now at last I may succeed in visiting you according to the will of God. And of course, at the end of the letter, uh, he, uh, he may, oh, this, con this continues on uh, as far as talking about how he wishes to visit them and impart with them and strengthen them in their faith. And I'm going, to move, I'm going to move on to the next, set, next uh, statement. What is Paul's message to the believers in Rome? Well, Paul's letter to the Romans about God's righteousness reveals that God's righteousness was exercised on behalf of all people. With this result, so that all those who claim to, know, to follow Jesus, namely Messiah, might live disobediently. No. 
so that we live righteously. What is the key verse in Romans? Well, it's predominantly 1, 15 to 17, where we read that, Thus I am eager also to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is God's power for salvation, everyone who believes, everyone, to the Jew first, and then to the Greek. For the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. When you think about the literary flow of Romans, when you sit down, you say, okay, how, what's going on here in Paul? Here's a nice little picture uh, that we could look at and, and understand. Romans begins with a prologue, and then it has an epilogue. Prologue is an introductory letter type of thing, telling here I am to the Romans and for this reason, and then he, he expands that opening. Then he moves into an epilogue, which is, uh, thank you for listening and uh, give my greetings to so-and-so and we greet you and so there's this so that's the opening and closing of Romans but in the middle in the middle of Romans we have God's righteousness revealed in his universal plan this is really important then we have this section that highlights the fact that Israel's rejection of and Gentile inclusion in God's righteousness and then we move into precepts for righteousness in everyday living. So, righteousness revealed and the universal plan, Israel's rejection of God's righteousness and yet Gentile inclusion, and precepts for righteousness in living every day. So, what does Romans contribute to God's big picture? All right. God's righteousness reveals in his universal plan the need for God's righteousness. It begins with the need for God's righteousness in the first three chapters. Then the provision of God's righteousness, for chapters uh, 4 and 5. And then the effects of God's righteousness, uh, um, 6 through 8. Now, I love uh, the need, uh, and we're going to... I got this verse about 321, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God, which is attested by the law and the prophets, has been disclosed. Namely, that the righteousness of God through the faithfulness of Jesus, who is the Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But they are justified freely by the grace through the redemption God is in the process of reestablishing his kingdom rule on earth and to redeem a people to enter into that kingdom for the redemption that is in Messiah Jesus. And, and I love Romans. So as Romans 1 begins by talking about the perversion of pagans. Oh, these, these perversions, these people who don't know God, they do this, they do that. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And then chapter 2, it talks about the moral person, and yet he's sinful. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Got that head bobbing. You ever see those bobbing heads on the, in the cars? Got that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then Paul says, and even you, Jewish people. <laughs> Whoa, kind of hard to get, stop that head from bobbing, eh? think you're righteous? All have sinned and have fallen short of God's glory. But the story doesn't end there because of the provision for righteousness, which is through Messiah, Jesus. And then we can say, as a result of that provision, in Romans 8, therefore, there is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Messiah Jesus. For the law of the life-giving spirit in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God achieved what the law could not do because it was weakened through the flesh. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and Concerning sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. With this result, 
the righteous required of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to that Spirit of God, which the Messiah has given to us as a gift and has imparted and given us the ability to live righteously. We can say no to sin. We have that ability. What does Romans contribute to God's big picture? Well, first, uh, secondly, I would say precepts for righteousness in everyday life. Precepts for righteousness in everyday life. God, in, uh, before God, in the church, and in society. Precepts for righteousness in everyday life, before God, in the church, and in society and when differences occur amongst us. And I just I need to quickly go through this. And these are some selections about how we are to live righteously within the church. Love. But not with hypocrisy. Oh, I, I love your dress. It looks very nice. Did you see what she was wearing? <laughs> That's hypocrisy. What you say to the brother or sister in public, and then what you say when they're not around. Don't love that way. Be devoted to one another with mutual love, showing respect and eagerness and, honor, and honoring one another. Bless those who persecute you and bless those and do not curse. Live, live, I, I, I've lost my slide. Live in harmony with one another. Now, that doesn't mean uniformity. It means in harmony. Harmony recognizes there's diversity within a piece of music. Live in harmony because everyone contributes to that piece. Everyone contributes to a church community. Live in harmony. Everyone brings something different. Live in harmony with one another. If possible, as far as it can tend, live peaceably with all people. Live at peace with people. And, and do not avenge yourself. Let God handle it. Remember, Jesus is coming, and he's going to judge. And don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And we think about within society, some selections. All right, this one's going to hurt. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, even when a liberal is in the office. <laughs> For there is no authority except by whose appointment? Our election? So the person who rejects such authority resists what? The ordinance of God. And then here, pay your taxes. Um, we find excuses why we ought not, but we're to pay our taxes. Oh, no one anything. Except what? Love. Love. So Matthew's contribution, as I wrap this up, and it's in your notes, Matthew's contribution to God's big picture is simply this. Knowing about our Messiah's life, example, and kingdom teaching affirms his disciples, empowers his disciples to live as kingdom saints, emboldens his disciples to proclaim the kingdom message, and energizes his disciples to stand firm for the kingdom, despite any conflict or rejection we may face at home, at work, in our neighborhoods. Paul's letter, as we think about his contribution, God's righteousness was exercised on behalf of all people because we all needed it with this intention, that all those who claim to follow Jesus, Messiah, might execute what? A life of righteousness. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as you live for the kingdom, live 
righteously. Thank you for watching. I hope you'll sit back and enjoy our next video concerning God's future story with an emphasis on the book of Revelation.